<laughs> Ta -da! Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you very much for coming along tonight. I'm sorry we couldn't both be there in person to see you, but um, I guess this is safer instead of breathing on you. Um, uh, and yeah. I'm one of the authors in the collection, and Noelle is my editor, which means that she got to crack the whip. <laughs> I did. It was fun. I've known Lucy for a long time, and this is, I think, the first time I got to crack a whip at you. So, <laughs> good. New, you know, sort of next level friendships there. Um, and of course, we're here tonight. I'm just going to hold it up. We're here tonight to talk about, there's my camera, the only one in the world of Sherlock Holmes anthology with its gorgeous wraparound cover. With all you um, children's yes, illustrated by um, Judith Russell, Jude Russell, the um, children's author. And inside, I'm just looking for this um, beautiful artwork by a woman named Andrea, um, who goes by Alto Cello on, um, on Twitter, uh, who did beautiful, like, fine little detailed images for each of the stories as well. So uh, we have 14 writers who did 13 stories. So one of the stories was co-written. Um, and yeah, like it was probably about two years altogether, year and a half um, to put it together. It was a little bit delayed because we had a pandemic and it's just let like everybody down. But we got there, we got there. Right, Noelle, how did you get the crazy idea to do this? <laughs> well, I'd always wanted to... Uh, do a Sherlock Holmes anthology anyway. My publisher uh, is Clandestine Press, so they publish other works of mine. Uh, and I approached uh, Lindy Cameron, who's the publisher, about um, doing an anthology. But partly it, it came from a bunch of different areas that all kind of coalesced once. But through the way fandom, you know, the fan fiction that gets written about Holmes and Watson and people sort of taking different approaches because they want to see perhaps, you know, part of their own worlds and their own lives kind of reflected in stories. And since the mainstream doesn't always do that, people do their own versions. And then there was a, a particular artist named Becca Duke. who did a gorgeous drawing of um, the uh, Anglo-Indian actor Dev Patel with Riz Ahmed. Uh, and so Patel was, was drawn as this kind of crazy Sherlock Holmes and Riz Ahmed, his very long suffering Watson. And it's at that moment, it just coalesced that I really wanted to read stories. I was really fascinated by the idea of what Sherlock Holmes or John Watson might have been like if they came from a completely different cultural background. So like, you know, I'm always getting asked questions from the other Sherlock Holmes stories that I've written, some of them in a modern context and things like that. Well, what is quintessential about Holmes and Watson? How do you change their location from Victorian England um, and, you know, all those things about them for there and still have them be Holmes and Watson? And I just thought, well, let's pull that apart. Let's put them in completely. How do you have, say, an Irish Holmes or Watson? How do you have some uh, a Holmes and Watson who might be from, you know, sort of some parts of um, South America or parts of Asia or whatever? What would make them different? How would they be afraid uh, you're sort of uh, shaped by those environments and yet still remain somehow the Holmes and Watson that we knew um, so that's that was the starting point and then so Lindy and I sat down and we sort of came up with a list of writers that we knew from lots of different backgrounds to approach to say would you like to have a go <laughs> and that's yeah that that was the starting point effectively my curiosity about how far you could push the idea and still have Holmes and Watson. Of Be course, Dev, Dev Patel's just done Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, which I'm really looking forward to see. Oh, very much. I, really, I like Patel in pretty much everything. He was fantastic in David Copperfield. So, like, you know, maybe one day our wish will come true and they'll get cast as well. <laughs> but so I'm not the first person to have done that. There have been under different names, sometimes not under the names of Holmes and Watson, but those characters have been sort of re-envisioned um, in lots of different ways. So I think it was just that I was explicitly putting them together or asking writers to play with that. that and the, the idea was not, it didn't have to be both the characters, but at least one of the two characters had to come from some basically non-white English Victorian background. Um, and everything else was just, I thought that was enough of a change for writers so, or enough prescription rather so like they could have the characters be any gender any sexuality anything that would help them best tell 
their story from their cultural perspective. Um, and that was for them to decide. So, yeah, we got a huge variety of responses for that. Well, yes, Kerry Greenwood, who you might, who some people might know, know as Franny Fisher, author, and her partner David Gregg wrote a um, story set in medieval Iceland, which is a, an aspect of Holmes and Watson I hadn't actually considered, but it's one of my favourites. We've got New Orleans, we've got Russia, we've got ancient Egypt. Um, it's, it's, quite a variety, it's quite a variety. Why I'm dressed up like this is because my detectives comes from the England in the 1600s. And so I just blithely said to Noelle, oh, I could try and dress up you know, for the time and then thought, how on earth am I going to do this in lockup? So I'm wearing my great aunt's crocheted tablecloth um, and some dangly earrings, which are period, and a, uh, wood, and a furry hat a la um, Rubens lady with a fur hat, but I'm not emulating her cleavage. Um, and underneath it is jeans. But I have actually made, actually made the effort to dress up for the occasion. And apart from anything else, I love dressing up. Yeah, and you always look fabulous when you do. I've made slightly less effort. Um, I'm wearing my favourite um, Holmesian T-shirt. I'm just going to tilt my uh, laptop up so you can see. My favourite non-Conan Doyle version of Holmes and Watson are um, Jeremy Brett and David Burke from the Granada TV series. And this is the T-shirt I got from Redbubble, which, um, which is them. So it's my favourite. And I have just a month, I have a big, a bit of a collection of, Holmesian stuff, but this is uh, one of my cushions in my my back little reading room that uh, I'm tucked into tonight. So, but I have all sorts of other things on my shelves in another room. Well, I've got a prop. This is sent to me some years ago. It's an English first. Can people see this? It's an English first day cover of the Holmes and Watson, and it really makes me wish that. You know, that people sent more letters because you can get gorgeous things like that. Yeah. By the way, if anyone has any questions they would like to ask Lucy and I as we chat, if you go to the bottom of your screen, uh, if you hover your mouse down there, there's a, one of the options is chat. Click on that. It'll open a chat window um, probably to the right of your screen and you can put any questions that you have for us in there and we'll do some Q&As. Um, a little bit later. Um, so yeah, I was going to ask um, Lucy to tell you all a little bit more about um, her story in the anthology, uh, which is called? It's called Mistress Islet and the General's Son. And the reason it's called that, well, you've got to read the story and get to the end, but I have prepared a show and tell. I have, um, I have a Yeah. Okay. And slideshow, slideshow, start from first slide, which you should be able to see. Can everybody see that? Yep. Okay. So my detective was actually based on a real person um, whose name was, whose maiden name was Anne Holmes, and I'm not making this up. And she was active in the 1600s, mid 1600s, in the English Civil War period and afterwards very dramatic time and she solved them her husband was murdered and she solved his murder and this is sourced in a pamphlet from the 1680s which gives you the full story of how she was investigated the murder which you could do in those days because they didn't have formal detectives and um, this is the murder scene in Chelmsford um, which is, I went there in 20, when we could in 2019. It is still very much like that, except, they don't, except that there's motor cars. And um, one of the things about um, Anne Holmes, who married Thomas Kidderminster, was that it's an aspect of womanhood that you don't actually think of from that time, so that woman, a woman could investigate her husband's murder. And one of my preoccupations is that women are so often we get men's lives and women are lost to history. We get the impressions of them in the negative space of men. And this is a Rubens sketch in which you can see is the painting and the preparatory sketches of the men. 
and the woman appears only as a silhouette. And this is a lot of how I feel about Anne Holmes in that she's a silhouette. We actually don't know what she looks like. There's no surviving portrait, but we know what she did. And that was quite important. She's the first known female detective. Um, and at that time, well, women, you know, they had to be rich, and uh, well connected to be um, immortalized in paint. And this is um, one of Charles II's mistresses, um, Barbara, lovely Lady Cleveland, who, um, yes, she's an ancestress of um, Princess Diana. And in this image, she's um, as being Athena, the goddess of wisdom, which, you know, having taking on the king as a lover was quite a wise decision because she made a lot of money. Um, but for a more middle class woman, it's quite, you have to look around. What did Anne Kidderminster look like? Well, this is a woman called um, Hester Tradiskant, who was married to a collector. Um, and again, this is, this is very much round about the mid the Puritan era, the black hat, the collars, um, but again, a very rich woman. So, but if we want to find out what a working class woman was, um, that's harder. English portraiture doesn't have this, so that you have to go across the sea to the golden age of Dutch painting. And so Anne, Anne, Anne Holmes was a lady's maid before she's married. And so here are two ladies maids by Michael Swietz, the girl in brown, although I think she was a seamstress because she's got needles in her bodice. And the other one is by Gerhard Turborch, very young girl. And she was essentially a servant. And her, when she married, she married Thomas Kidderminster, who was a steward, that is an administrator of an estate. They were married less than a year, and then he disappeared, he was murdered. And she was left a widow, a young pregnant widow. So here are a couple of images of widows of the time, again, rich women. And you might notice that they have a distinctive headdress. Well, this is where the expression widow's peak comes from. I was trying to make one like yesterday um, for this talk, and I'm sorry to say it, it ended up looking as if I was wearing my underwear on my head. So I scratched that idea. And but there's another image of a, of a widow that does inform my sense of Anne. And this is again a Tuborch, a wonderful picture of grief, an unknown, an unknown widow. And Anne was left alone and had to make her own living and she was pregnant. No destitute of friends and relatives. So she didn't have many options. Now she's the only detective known to have been a wet nurse. Um, this wasn't such a bad a job as it sounds because if you got into a wealthy family, um, you were looked after very well. And this is Louis XIV and his wet nurse who was wearing an absolutely magnificent dress. Um, or half wearing it. Well, half wearing it, yes. Um, and uh, going back to Anne again, um, so I had my detective and I had Anne um, and she was home. So, so, and I'd written, already written a book about her, which I am trying to sell at the moment. Um, and when then and when Narelle approached me, I thought, well, what a brilliant idea. I'd simply use my home's detective. That's that's easy. I've done all the research. Here's one I prepared earlier. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then I thought, what who's my Watson? And I can't be use a what use a white um, a white English person. What can I do? And then there was one very obvious answer. And this is um, to make him an African. And there are quite a lot of contemporary painting, wealthy people with their African. Slavery wasn't, the, wasn't mass market. And so these people could either be servants or either they could be slaves. It's very hard to tell the difference. Um, you can see in the second illustration of Lady Murray that um, he's wearing a most magnificent pearl in his, in his ear, but then he's subservient. His pose is subservient. The other image, the very indistinctly glimpsed man, he was actually painted out and they only found it 
um, when they were storing the painting. And I think that's fairly typical of how history is complica more complicated and more cosmopolitan than we realise. Mm. And I'd like to finish this slideshow with one other thing, one other image. And I only discovered this today. Um, what I wanted was an image of, this is a century later, an image where of white and African where they appear more, more equitable. And this is quite an extraordinary image um, in that they're equals, they're friends, they may be something more. Um, but it is, what, this is something of the relationship which I would hope my Anne and my Watson have, if not lovers, then certainly friends. And that was what, was what I was aiming for in this story. So I'll go back to stop share. And here we, and that's about really all I've got to say about the story, except that again, I borrowed a true crime incident, which again came from the, from a, from the following century because it was simply too good not to use. True crime actually has the best stories. Yeah, true crime often contains things that, um... It's hard to make up because you'll be accused of being unrealistic. <laughs> Absolutely. And real yeah. life is so much stranger. Like the thing is that fiction has to make sense and real life does not. So that's always a little bit of a, a challenge when working on things there. Uh, before I get on to the questions, and there are a few popping up there, um, Lucy uh, did previously ask me that, said, oh, you could talk about your favourite story in the collection. And it's like, oh, no, it's like picking your favourite child. It's like, can't be done, or at least admitted to. Uh, <laughs> certainly not by the editor. But I will say one of the things I loved about editing these stories and about the stories that we have in the collection, uh, and I've, I've said this in a couple of other places as well, is that one of the kind of amusing things about Arthur Conan Doyle's stories is that he kind of didn't really care about continuity. He would just have a go and write the story that came to him at that time. And so there's lots of different aspects of the character so that within the, the whole canon of all the short stories and the novels, they do end up with this kind of cohesive sense of uh, the personalities of the characters. And sometimes, you know, the, those personalities might um, seem a little contradictory, but again, like human beings are. Um, but some of his stories are kind of a bit darker with a bit more of a horror twist. Some are sort of funnier and with a, you know, kind of a lighter uh, approach. Some are like um, The Hound of the Baskervilles. It's very epistolary. So there's letters as well as the narrative and things like that. So each of the stories, although they're coming from like completely different cultural backgrounds, con completely different time periods, sometimes the, the, the gender switch, some of them are queer things like that but every single story does reflect some aspect of how Conan Doyle wrote the original story so they'll be they'll di they'll be different in each one um, and we've got the delightfully comedic um, story from Natalie Konya set in Poland um, and to do with kind of Polish uh, folk stories about the uh, the town of Helm which is populated by the most foolish people because all the foolish people fell out of the angel's bag into that town so uh, and the Watson um, goes visiting that so it's a much more comedic story but you know it taps into some of those um, funnier sides of, of Conan Doyle story so every story that is in the book you can follow the thread back to like where the seeds of that story are in the original Conan Doyle things. And so like there's something for me, certainly there's something to love um, in every single story, which calls back to the things that I love about Conan Doyle. So don't make me pick a favorite, Lucy, it can't be done. No, in some respects, I mean, they're just so, they're just so very different. Um, they appeal to different, they all appeal to different people. Um, should we tell the story about the bees and the wasps? It's a bit hard though. We've got this beautiful um, internal artwork uh, from Andrea, um, which actually came about because we originally had a different concept for the cover and we tried it and Andrea was doing our artwork for that, but it didn't quite work out. So she'd done images for the stories. Um, and in the end we thought, look, the work is so beautiful. We don't want to miss it. So we'll, we'll put that to her artwork internally. Um, but then when we came to um, match the art, Andrea's art to Lucy's story, um, 
none of the rest of us were really noticing the fact that Andrea had done a beautiful B and that's like a, a B artwork is very Sherlock and you know so that was part of some of the original work that had been looked at and, and, and asked for uh, and then Lucy pointed out that rather importantly the insect of choice in her story was not a bee but a wasp so uh, Andrea had to redraw that one but she did very quickly she did a beautiful job well, I only knew that because um, because I'd been stung by one. And if you want to know the difference, bees are fluffy and wasps have wastes. Hence the expression oh, well, there you go. Wasp, wasp waste. But um, three cheers for the for, for getting onto the artwork in a hurry. <laughs> ah, yeah, look, she was she was fantastic. She responded very very quickly. Um, I thought maybe we'll uh, look at some of the questions that we have now. Um, and one of the first questions uh, from Vasant was whether or not any of the stories were adapted from uh, original Conan Doyle stories. And all of them are original. They're, um, so, so they're completely new. Some of them hark back or maybe drop in references, um, but none of them is a direct um, retelling of any of the original stories. So they're all new and original um, mysteries uh, and, uh, and approach in a completely different uh, way as well. Like I said, you know, I said some of them are quite comedic, some are a bit more horror tinged, like uh, Ray Gates, um, who normally writes horror. Um, so he's got that little thread of horror, which Conan Doyle was also very good at um, running through his story, The Enemy Within. Um, but yeah, they're all uh, um, separate from the original work. So obviously, um, you know, there'll be references inspired, to the inspired by by. reference to. Beautiful. Sorry, Lucy. I was just going to say I've got a question here from Polly who can't speak because she's got a cough if she starts speaking. It'll set her, set her cough off. So Sorry, I'll just ask on Polly's behalf. Um, did you manage to do all, and Lucy, I believe this question is for you following your slideshow. Did you manage to do all the research online? Uh, no, I actually, in 2019, I went to England and I went to Chelmsford and I went to the archives and I looked at the original documents. And once you actually get there, you can, there's, it is, it was, you got the sense of place. Um, but you'd be amazing what you can get um, online. And most of these images in the flight slideshow I just grabbed from various art collections. And you can find out a lot. Um, but there's nothing like going to a place and experiencing it if you're writing about it, hmm. because that that gives that gives you such a sense of a lived in, of a walked in, lived in history. It's a much more, more holistic response. It's not just what it looks like, but you know, it's it's the sounds, the smells, the the you know how the light, the you know the uh, hits the buildings and things like that. You know, being in a place. Um, is always just more evocative and deeper than than just looking at pictures online. Though in a pinch of pictures online, when you are not able to get out to places, <laughs> will we'll give you a good starting point. <laughs> uh, Polly's gone on to ask, was there anything in the local parish records that you could access? Um, you can, um, yeah, the, the archives office in in. In England, there's a lot of stuff online, and if you're interested in witchcraft, there's there's heaps of st stuff in um, sort of in, in East Anglia. It it was the, all sorts of records have survived, but I hadn't I didn't actually do the. You can use Ancestry.com if you're really stuck. Wonderful Great. resource. We've got uh, another question from Suzanne. Uh, Lucy, how, how did you find out about your main character in the first place? How did you discover her? How did she discover you? Um, what happened was that um, I was doing a PhD thesis and I said, I, and there was a novel from the 1840s which had a female detective who was a servant. And I happened to remark to a friend of mine um, who was an academic, well, that's odd, I, I swear, there must be real life precedents for people who were investigating their crimes in the absence of a formal police force or detection. And she said, funny you should mention that because um, there was just a seminar given at the University of WA 
um, on a case from the 1600s where a woman investigated her husband's murder. And I said, oh, wow. So, and so Deborah, I'm sorry, Deborah, I have completely forgotten your name, but um, very kindly sent me the information. Uh, she was a PhD student. And that was where I learned on this case. And I just thought, this, this is really an extraordinary story. It's wonderful that, you know, like you just, as a writer, you just have to be curious about the world and talk to people and be open to ideas because all sorts of strange things can sort of cross your radar and then you, you know, you can seize upon them and follow those threads to see where it will take you and what kind of inspirations um, it will give you for a story. So, I mean, I think that's actually one of the, uh, one of the key criteria for being a writer is that you you have to be kind of really curious about the world and really open to, you know, just. There's no rounds frozen for anybody else. Just seeing what's out. Oh, there you are. I'm okay. Out there and what people might bring. Oh. You back, Narelle? Uh, well, I didn't know I was gone, so. <laughs> okay. The gremlins attacked. Oh, darn. So you're like, oh, that's a great speech that will never happen again. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you um, think it, what is it about true crime and mystery and, yeah, that, that makes it so fascinating to read and write about? What What is that for you ladies? Obviously, as writers, you are naturally curious, but I think that's, I think humans are curious about, about crime and problem solving and what is it about it, do you think? I, don't know, I mean, for myself, I think it's partly it's like um, you try to make sense of the world and you try to, like human beings have always looked for patterns and try to understand what happens in their environment so that they can predict what may happen next and try to stay safe. Um, potentially, there's also trying to predict what's happening in the world and try to get away with getting rid of your enemies. <laughs> Could be part of it. But I, I, I feel that a lot of Sort of crime writing and the fascination with true crime which i have myself is is part of that you're looking for like in a really primal way part of that pattern recognition about you know try to understand um the hazards of the world we inhabit and how you might therefore um manage them and also looking for justice mm. there is such a thing as justice um you can see crime fiction developing from People are moving away from public hangings and they're interested in motive. They don't believe it's the devil that's behind everything, but they wonder, they wonder what makes people do things. And I think it's a fascination to the dark side and how, and how we can combat that that's still very prevalent with us now. I think we're so drawn to detective stories too because usually there's an outcome. Usually the mystery gets solved and we have a conclusion, which may be at odds with how we experience life <laughs> in yeah, real life. Yeah. Life doesn't always come up with an answer and it's not always linear. Um, so it's, you know, it's like I said, as I was saying before, the uh, like fiction has to make sense in a way that life doesn't always, you know, life just happens and we make stories out of it later. We pick patterns and try to make sense of it after the fact um it's just you know events occurring to you fiction helps to kind of contextualize and we try to put things into you know um sequences that make sense and also there's the puzzle i mean it's like following a um a crime case in the newspaper and thinking oh who done it oh that looks like a likely suspect or even on the news you know you you're following this case oh my god you know are they going to find another part of the body um, and you and you could just it just really you know we're voyeuristic we're just voyeuristic creatures. <laughs> That's true. I've got another question here coming up. Uh, Lucy, did your lady find her husband's murderer, or do I need to read the book when it's published? Well, I can tell you that um, she not only she was able to act, uh, prosecute him in court. You would, you would think that women couldn't be lawyers, but if you were the injured party in a murder case and there was no man, a woman could stand up in court and prosecute the case, and this is what she did. It's very Viola. I'm trying to think of, like, in Shakespeare, she would have had to dress up as a man to do that. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> 
So that's good. That's good. There was an earlier question about somebody asking whether or not we'd seen the BBC version of Sherlock or not. Like I've seen not all. There's a lot of Sherlock's out there. There's been like it's 130, nearly 140 years since the books were first published. So there's a lot of different versions. <laughs> Um, and I've only recently purchased um, DVD sets of the two different Russian versions that were done as well, which I've started to watch. But yes, I watched BBC Sherlock. I've seen the Japanese Miss Sherlock, which I really enjoyed as well. Um, the Granada TV series was my the, was actually the um, what brought me to Conan Doyle. Um, that was the series that got me fascinated with the uh, the stories and took me to them. Um, so uh, I mean, one of the things about BBC Sherlock is that kind of it lost me. Um, uh, in the last two seasons I didn't like it as much then but one of the things it did was to show that you could completely change kind of the setting and even the technology um, of those stories but still have these two characters be essentially recognizable as Arthur Conan Doyle's original characters and in Miss Sherlock you've actually got two female um, versions of the character that tv series owes a lot more to BBC Sherlock than it does to uh, to Conan Doyle but again you know, it's putting in this Japanese context and in that context it's actually quite funny that Miss the, the character called Miss Sherlock is so rude and in a Japanese cultural context that's much more shocking to some of the police officers and then their um their Lestrade type character I love him because every time Miss Sherlock is really rude and the the other Japanese cops are like oh that's so offensive he's just in the corner laughing his head off he finds her very <laughs> funny um the way she just doesn't pay much attention to those social wars and that's that both BBC Sherlock and Miss Sherlock are so different to because uh, Conan Doyle's Sherlock he's a well-mannered gentleman the person he's generally rude to is Watson but they're really good mates and Watson occasionally gets his own back so so it doesn't, you know, those, those... It doesn't matter I mean it's about the relationship between those two mm -hmm. and, yeah. I just have a question Narelle about the editing process mm -hmm. Did you come across any characters that you thought, oh, I wish this was my character and I could rewrite the ending? <laughs> How hard no, was I, it to read on I don't, I don't necessarily feel that what my reaction is more like, I love this character, I will... But do I have a... Um... Uh, a 19th century version of them in a book called The Adventure of the Colonial Boy, uh, which is a queer interpretation of the characters and it's set uh, in the period and the Conan Doyle stories where Sherlock Holmes is meant to be dead. Um, and uh, in the end, in that story, there's a, another adventure going on. He ends up sending a, a telegram to Watson, who's furious because he thought Holmes was dead and he's very annoyed to find out his friend has lied to him. And they go, he comes storming to Australia to kind of help solve this um, the mystery that he's working on. But he's really angry and there's a bit of a confrontation between the two of them as part of that story out in the middle of the Victorian um, bush and things like that. So, you know, I have my own interpretations and uh, I've said before, if we um, if there's enough interest and we end up doing a second volume, I absolutely want to do my own version of Holmes and Watson as Australian hipsters, because um, <laughs> oh, cool. because the, the the Victoria like the mustaches and the excellent suits and the you know the whole focus they are such Melbourne hipster baristas. So you know I have already ideas uh, and I've written for them for a different anthology actually. Um, yeah, Holmes, you know. Holmes and Watson running a cafe in Melbourne and solving crimes in Melbourne. That would be really, really cool because I can imagine contemporary characters, like the tech that they would use oh, as yeah. well, find my phone, they'd like plant it on somebody and then track them through the city. All sorts of things, yep. Yeah. And they they wear really like the, the you know, Watson would still have his moustache all waxed and but he'd be using mm. all the like the best moustache um, oils and waxes and stuff from one of those hipster places where they sell it all and they'd be very snappy dresses and, and they'd <laughs> and they'd be really particular about their coffee very particular mm -hmm. about their coffee. uh and like I said, this isn't my idea it's something that i read online at tumblr but it makes absolute sense that perhaps a modern hipster sherlock holmes is not a cocaine addict he just drinks a lot of red bull <laughs> <laughs> yes, that actually that would actually suit his personality quite uh, quite well in that modern context. So you know that's a possibility we might play with in the future. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would like for 
each of these writers, you know, there was, if there's another story in them with those characters to, mm. to share, I would love to read more. Mm. And tell me, Narelle, in the editing process, was it difficult to, yeah, to tell people where you needed to trim or to extend on something? How involved were you with uh, people and how tricky was that? It wasn't really, though every now and then, like sometimes I'd be going, like, so for, for Kerry Greenwood and David Gregg, they've got a Viking Sherlock Holmes. And so, you know, I'm asking questions like, his name's nothing like Sherlock. Can we make him a bit more Sherlocky at all? And because they're the, you know, um, the people who've got that knowledge and expertise about the time period. So David's there going, no, we can't do that because there's just no names that are like that. And so I had to bow to their, because, you know, there's no point in getting somebody who's a cultural expert and then ignoring their cultural expertise. So mm -hmm. we worked together to find other ways to bring out the Sherlockiness of their, um, their Viking Sherlock. Um, so um, a few more things in the canon. So that's just one example, but that's the example I chose because also I'm sitting there as a, an editor and this is the first time I was a commissioning editor. I've mm -hmm. edited other books, but this is the first time I was a commissioning editor for an anthology and working with all these writers who, you know, have done lots of work and are amazing. And I'm just, every now and then I'd be going, I'm editing Kerry Greenwood. Oh, the cheek, the cheek of me. <laughs> but, you know, the thing is about, you know, you're working with these, these writers who like Lucy and Kerry and, uh, and these people who've got um, experience and expertise and they're very professional. They're, they know that your job as an editor is to help them tell the best story, their story, the best way that you can. So like, I'm trying to look out for, Okay, where, where are there maybe a few continuity areas, errors? Where can we uh, beef this up a little bit? Can we, how can we help shape this to be the best version of the story that they want to do? And you've got to have confidence as an editor that that's, um, that's what you're seeing, what you're looking at and you're discussing. But also mm. it's a collaboration. So I'm never just dictating to somebody else, to another writer, you must mm. do X, Y, and Z. It's like, this is what I'm seeing. This is how I feel about it. Could you try this? How does that work for you? So it's a it's a discussion and a collaboration. It's not a uh, it's not a dictatorship. It's not me just telling people what to, how to write their story. It's like working together to tease through um, options and discuss ideas or to say, oh, there seems to be a continuity error here. How can we work with that? And you know, I find most of the time, um, and it's certainly with every writer in this anthology. Um, you know, writers know that that's your job as an editor is to help them look really good, even better than they are. So, um, yeah, it was a, it was a it was a joyful experience. I loved doing it, uh, and I'm now currently um, contacting some writers about a different anthology which I pitched to Clandestine Press, and Ooh. I've started to approach writers on that now because I like I love the experience so much. I'm really looking forward to doing it again. It sounds wonderful. It sounds like you thoroughly enjoyed it. It's great. I don't know. I don't know how Lucy feels. Like put you on the spot, Lucy. Yeah, Lucy. Did was you I like okay it? to work with? <laughs> um, no, it was fine. It was fine. <laughs> I haven't received any hate mail. We're doing fine. <laughs> I've just. Um, I think Suzanne's just asked. Uh, made a comment question here, and I think it's sort of um leading on from what you were saying, Yorel, about you know, can you make a character more Sherlocky? What defining characteristics are essential to characters like Sherlock and like Watson? If we're changing so much about them, how do we, what is it that they need to keep? With Sherlock well, an enigmatic nature, I'd say. Mm -hmm. what, what would you say, Noelle? Um, that and I, I think just his voracious curiosity about the world. He's just um, he's very engaged in the world. And like when he's on a case too, he's very tactile. He's not uh, he doesn't stand around like Poirot being a bit prissy and not getting his feet dirty. You know, like he'll be on his belly and sniffing stuff. He's so uh, for a man who who claims to be quite ascetic, he's really steeped in tactile. And physical part uh, of his world so he's got this voracious curiosity and he'll throw himself into things um but he's also got a passion for for justice i mean he likes to solve the puzzle 
Um, but you know, we know from the original stories too that he won't. He doesn't always worry about being paid for it either. He wants to solve the puzzle. He wants to bring justice to people who have suffered, and he doesn't really care um, what part of society you're from. He'll dismiss somebody who's like royalty or very high up for being a bit snooty and not sharing all the details. He he said in one of the stories, "Look, I can't work on this for you if you don't give me everything. So goodbye. I'm quite busy. I'm sure you are too." Prime Minister, you know, <laughs> and goes on. So, like, he has an egalitarian approach to what he's doing because he's he's about the puzzles and he's about that engagement. Uh, for Watson, I think the key, one of the key things for Watson is his loyalty. He's a he's a, a true and loyal friend. He's very um, again, he's very committed to that idea of justice. I think the one thing that often gets forgotten in in, in um, pastiches and rewrites is that Watson's got quite a sense of humour. He's and he's the most long-suffering man in all of England. The, the way he puts up with um, Holmes's moods when he's bored and not in the case. And yeah, you know, if you invited them for dinner, you could be sure that Watson would bring would bring a would bring wine. Yes, <laughs> he's a well-mannered man. <laughs> Beautiful. So, ladies, we're we're at about the fifty minute mark now. So, if if there's anyone else that would like to ask any questions, pop them in the chat now, or feel free to unmute yourself and you can talk to Lucy and Narell in real time. No, mm, I wonder. Ah, I don't know if you're all seeing in the uh, the chat there, but uh, Vasanth was just saying um, they'd want to make um, film content on homes, and like I am so there for this. I actually harbour little secret desires that one day I'll make for Australian television the Australian hipster barista um, TV series of Holmes and Watson. Like you've got BBC Sherlock, you've got Miss Sherlock in Japan. Why can't we do our Aussie version? So yeah, let's chat. Why not? <laughs> Because, as I was saying before, like Conan Doyle really didn't care about continuity. So there's there's a lot of stuff that he would just throw something in with the character and then 10 stories later, he throws in something slightly different. It means that this, the, the characters are always open to multiple interpretations. And my my attitude has always been every interpretation is a valid interpretation. As a reader and as a viewer, you're bringing your own life experience to what you're seeing. And... Um, so that's the filter through which, like, and, and all fiction, any time you're reading a book, you as a reader are bringing your own filters to that. So your interpretations go through whatever your life experience is. So regardless of what the author may have intended, you as a reader, your filter um, affects that interpretation. And I don't think, um, you know, unless there's something like really obviously factually based, like this character is, you know, a black character and maybe as a reader saying, oh, I'm just not seeing that word, <laughs> you know, perhaps there's a question there. But, you know, it's, it's there's a lot of different interpretations and they're all including like, was Holmes asexual? Was he merely celibate? Was he queer? Was he, you know, yeah, all of those above. <laughs> he could be any of those things. And um one you know one person's interpretation doesn't have to affect or even matter to somebody else who interprets it differently because you know we're all bringing our own like I say we're all bringing our own baggage and our own filters to what we're reading and what we're um, looking for and, and what we identify with and how characters behave mm. which is one of the best things about reading isn't it is that yeah it offers something different to everybody like you know, like people's experiences in the world, isn't it? You see the world not as it is, but how you are. Mm. To uh, Superzinski's just pointed out that, yeah, like Doyle was really not consistent. There are questions and there's some rather joking and side questions about whether uh, John Watson was in fact um, some kind of bluebeard killing off his wives because <laughs> different wives have different... Um, so Mary Morstan, who's the, the first wife that we know of uh, in the stories, is an orphan, but in a later story, she's off visiting her mother. There is one story, this is hilarious, this is where uh, Watson's wife calls him James. 
so like, ah, oh, was she having an affair? Was there a slip of the tongue? <laughs> Um, but uh, that's where the idea that John H. Watson's middle name is Hamish is because, well, his wife once called him James. Maybe that's a pet name based on the name Hamish, which is the Scots for James. And so, like, fans have been, like, running interference on interpretation of the, uh, the inconsistencies in, in Arthur Conan Doyle since about 1887 when the book's first book came out. <laughs> so tell us, where do we get your book? You can get it all kinds of places. The best, uh, most direct place to get it from is Clandestine Press, which is at uh, clandestinepress.net. Um, I think that you had that information on the Eventbrite page. That's so correct. Clandestine, D-E-S-T-I-N-E, press.net. And you can get hardback, paperback, or um, either um, ebook. Uh, the the Kindle or um, EPUB versions there, but and look at any on your, whatever your favourite online bookseller is, you'll be able to um, get copies from all of those places. Beautiful. Any plans to turn it into an audio book? Oh, well, that's something for clandestine press um, to be thinking about, but uh, they are thinking about things. Um, they say it's a small press and of course preparation for an audio book is quite expensive because you've got to pay um, performers to or a performer to do the reading and there's all the um, audio editing and the sound engineering and stuff like that so if it's coming it's probably a while away but it's it's on our wish list. Excellent and Narelle and Lucy where can we find you and follow your work so that we can look out for the sequel or for when another book gets published? Um, well I'm at narellemharris.com so n-a-r-r-e-l-l-e M Harris, H A R R I S dot com. So that's my whole website. I've got a blog there. Um, but Clandestine Press does a blog as well. So you can have a look there and um, they'll always tell you when something new is coming as well. Lucy? I must confess that I've got to, up, I've got to completely demolish and rebuild my website. So it's um, not much useful. But you can find me being pontificating about all sorts of things on Twitter and being rude about politicians. Um, <laughs> and um, and also on Facebook, and I tend to have work coming out in various forms, you know, reviews, um, short story collections, and and as I said, this book which I'm trying to sell at the moment. Yes, terrific. So tell me, what's your Twitter handle so we can find you? I'm, I'm just Lucy Sussex. I'm just under my real name. I'm I'm there as Daggy Vamp because of a, a vampire character who was <laughs> the dag, which is on one of my first books and the handle has stuck, but all my um, social media links are on that website. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. That was just a little bright spot of sunshine in our silly lockdown lives. But yeah, thank you so much for your time and for answering all the questions. I think I've definitely taken something away from sort of learning about the editing process and that collaboration. I love I loved hearing you speak about that, Narelle. And Lucy, it was lovely to hear from your very own mouth about that character development. So I think everybody has really enjoyed tonight. So thanks again for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thank and you so much.